Good afternoon. What an inspiring day. I keep thinking back to that awesome video this morning, the iconic images of transistors and wafers and chips overlaid with the voice of God repeating, Moore's Law, Moore's Law, Moore's Law. Indeed, Moore's Law defined generations of technological progress in this industry and in this country. But as many of us who have worked in technology know, innovation isn't driven by laws or architectures or cost curves. Innovation is driven by people. Moore's Law would have been meaningless without the tireless work of individuals in this industry who willed it to be true every step of the way. So rather than talk about Moore's Law, let's take a moment to talk about Moore. Gordon Moore grew up in what was then a pretty rural part of California, Pescadero, farm country, best artichoke bread in the world. His dad was a county sheriff. He went to state school, fueled by a childhood interest in blowing things up with his chemistry kits that he got in the mail. And he ended up as a PhD at Caltech. Turns out Dow rejected him for a job, so he took a postdoc at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab but he didn't find academic life very fulfilling. In fact, he found himself spending time calculating the price that taxpayers were paying per word of his academic articles. He had a hankering to do something he saw as more practical. And that's when he see, received a fateful call. This is Shockley, said the voice on the other line, as if everyone should know what that meant. Bill Shockley, who had led the team that invented the transistor at Bell Labs, had recently started a company to commercialize that technology, Shockley Semiconductor. Moore joined as an early employee, and you know the story from there. From Shockley came Fairchild, and from Ch Fairchild came Intel, along with a fair majority of the company names written on badges at the summit. A lot of things need to happen for a new scientific insight to transform an industry. It takes building a foundation of knowledge and discovery, like at APL or Shockley was doing at Bell Labs, the tech push. And it takes a set of micro and macroeconomic drivers to drive value, the market pull. But I'm convinced that if you replay the story of any successful transformation of society with technology, You'll find a point in time in that story where an individual or a group commits their life to bringing those worlds together. Standing at the frontier of science in the land of the tech push and reaching out, hoping to find some hand in the world of the market. That reach is the epic struggle of the science innovator. And in the moment, it's hard to know whether theirs is an act of genius or an act of insanity. Sometime, in, as in the case of Moore, the reach succeeds and they go down in history. But more often, they fail. Win or lose, though, it's that fearless struggle that moves the ball forward and sets the stage for the rest of us. I run an organization called Activate. We're a nonprofit that exists because we believe that the science innovator is an invaluable asset to the world and the country and far too rare a commodity. Activate has one singular goal to support and cultivate science innovators who can drive the most important technology transformation society needs now and in the future. The origin of our organization stems from a partnership with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to create a program called Cyclotron Road, which we now proudly refer to as the world's first entrepreneurial fellowship program. The motivation behind Cyclotron Road was simple. The ubiquity of digital technology and venture capital has made entrepreneurship accessible to anyone with a laptop and a vision for the next big food delivery app. But science innovators in areas like physics and chemistry and materials, they can't play that same game. In these areas, you need more than a computer, a stand-up desk, and a six-week accelerator to transform an idea into something that looks like a product. We had a hunch that the best scientists and engineers in this country had the ambition to innovate, but were struggling to get their footing. Their motivations too applied for the world of academia, and yet their ideas still far too speculative for the world of corporations and venture capital. So we tried to create a new path to support them as entrepreneurs. Our fellowships empower top scientists and engineers with two years of time to singularly focus on the transition from lab to product. During that time, they're supported by world-class researchers, 
and facilities at Berkeley Lab, one of the Department of Energy's flagship 17 national laboratories. And finally, we surround them with a really strong community of industry and finance experts who can help guide their concept towards a product. Since 2015, more than 850 entrepreneurial scientists and engineers from around the country have applied to Psychotron Road. We've supported over 50 fellows to date, and they've demonstrated that our support can enable key learning cycles, new discoveries, world record and world record prototypes. In some cases, our fellows come to realize that perhaps that exciting technology doesn't make sense as a product or a business, and that's okay. But others find their path forward. With only three classes graduated, our fellows have started over 30 companies and collectively attracted more than $100 million in seed stage funding from some of the most reputable shops across venture, corporations, and government. As a fellowship, we support people, not just any people, but those rare few with the capacity for both scientific discovery and entrepreneurship who can uniquely change the game. Let me give you a few examples of fellows we've been able to support, thanks in large part to our partnership with DARPA's microsystems office. Kara Beasley and Jay Provine met at Stanford. Kara then reconnected with Jay after a stint as a process engineer at Applied Materials. Their project is largely inspired by DARPA's vision of 3D integrated circuits that can deliver 100 to 1,000 times improvements in the speed and efficiency of computing. They aim to be the world's first major supplier of wafer scale line carbon nanotubes to enable this future architecture, delivering highly selective perfectly aligned CMOS compatible arrays of CNTs. Alexei Marchinkoff was once a tenured professor at Georgia Tech, but he couldn't ignore the siren song of entrepreneurship. We've been supporting him as he's established a nascent startup, Bleximo, which is building special purpose quantum computation systems. The systems he's building utilize superconducting qubits and quantum ASIC technology to aid conventional computers in solving industry and government's hardest practical problems and with a highly competitive spirit, he's racing to be the first to show that quantum can beat classical for simulations and encryption. Mitchell Singh and Parker Gold just graduated out of Marty Schmidt's group at MIT. They're imagining a radically new paradigm for semiconductor manufacturing that would allow for cost-effective chip production at far smaller scale, effectively allowing for a decentralized and domestic manufacturing model for microelectronics of the same sort that 3D printing is enabling across other industries. After high school, Jesse Adams spent a decade working his way up at a cleaning systems company out of Richmond, Virginia, eventually managing over 100 franchise owners. He then decided to go to college for a degree in physics. That led to a PhD at Rice where he invented a new lensless digital imaging approach which can intrinsically encrypt an image in hardware, allowing for inherently private analysis and direct source authentication authentication of photos and videos. With trust in information at an all-time low, this is clearly an important need. And finally, in DARPA's spirit of looking beyond, we have fellows developing completely out-of-the-box approaches. Nishida Deka, an SRC graduate fellow, teamed up with lab mate Dominic Lebanowski in Saif Selhuddin's lab at Berkeley. They're developing a new class of high-sensitivity room temperature magnetic sensors based on a new approach of acoustically driven ferromagnetic resonance. The ability to measure extremely weak magnetic fields at room temperature could open the door to the first practical non-invasive brain computer interface. And the core technology could also be important for trusted navigation systems for the military. And there are many more of these fellows and stories which I wish I could tell you. But I'm gonna stop because I think I know what you're thinking, especially in this room, in this industry. These look like some sharp folks and some shiny faces, but there's no way a three-person startup is ever going to make a dent in my industry. And you're right, we should be skeptical. They're facing the impossible. But I'd argue that that's the point. We've just invested in training these amazing individuals to be leaders in their technical fields, and they're willing to stare the impossible head on and take a first step. And if they don't, who will? Gordon Moore, Gordon Moore heard the same skepticism from industry experts in his day. He's gone on record saying that he could never imagine the transformation his work spawned. And it, he's also said if it hadn't been for the luck of that call from Shockley, he would have been off working for some other company today or maybe be a professor somewhere. Many of our fellows will tell you the same thing. In the absence of our support, 
They'd have been ha they would have been hard pressed to find a path forward for their work. Some of them would be in academia or industry, but actually a bunch of them would have left science altogether for a job in finance or management consulting. Instead, we're trying to keep them in the game. At the end of his career, Moore came back to Caltech and gave a lecture on his life as an innovator. This was the title, The Accidental Entrepreneur. He says there's such a thing as a natural born entrepreneur, but he was an accidental entrepreneur. He had to either fall into the opportunity or get pushed in it. I'd argue we can't afford right now to wait for the accidental entrepreneur. We're at an inflection point. The technologies and the systems we created in the last century are proving inadequate against the challenges of the next century. Whether it be energy infrastructure under the threat of an unstable climate, or telecommunication, telecommunication infrastructure under the threat of geopolitical forces or a lack of trust. In any event, we need to transform our biggest industries and basically redeform, redefine the world's physical infrastructure in order to, to support sustainable, peaceful life in this country and on the planet. But there's reason to be hopeful. I think we have all the resources we need to make that happen. In this country alone, we graduate 40,000 science and engineering PhDs a year. Roughly a quarter of those will end up in academia, but that leaves an army 30,000 strong that could be deployed as entrepreneurs to transform our future industries. And between government and industry, we have the best minds, the most advanced infrastructure, and the biggest research budget of anywhere in the world to support them in that impossible task. I'm looking forward to working with this community to activate those resources and bring them to bear in support of the next generation of science innovators. Our next call for applications opens October 1st, and we look forward to supporting more fellows crazy enough to imagine the future of this industry and commit their lives to making those dreams a reality. Thanks. <laughs>